Hi, I'm Michelle Ward. As a mom, I've looked my children in the eyes with love and hoped I can lead them toward a bright, wonderful future. But as a neurocriminologist who's been studying violent crime for the last 20 years, I've also quietly hoped that at the very least, I'm not raising a future serial killer. And if you can relate to that taboo thought, congratulations, you've just found your new favorite podcast. This is How Not to Raise a Serial Killer. Hi, Krista. Hi, Michelle. Nice to see you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Of course. You're the only friend I have who listens to everything I do, and I appreciate it. You're so welcome. (laughs) So my friend Krista here is a mom of three and a former teacher. I always love that because you have double insight. Yes, lots of kids to draw. It's good to, to approach things as a mom and also as an educator, especially since we do call on educators a lot in this. And I feel bad about that because they have so much on their freaking plates. There's so much on their plates. But it's a, it's a good perspective. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's a dynamic where you're caring for someone else's kids. So you see things a little bit more clearly. I mentioned the bridge program in another episode. And it was more complicated than I think I knew. You would be like the exact sensitive enough person to go on it, whether that's a good or bad thing. Because you are the sensitive person you are, this risk factor for violence we're going to discuss is something you'd be very sensitive to. And it's a strange risk factor, and I'm not going to say any more about it, but I try to pick the cases that match the guest. And I think, we'll see. We'll see if you like we'll it. See. We'll see. If we'll I see like if you it. like it. We'll see if you like <laughs> it. I suspect I will not. <laughs> <laughs> see how you like murder. I mean, it's so funny. You're such a good sport because I know this scares you. But it does scare me, but in the light of day and looking at my friendly face, my friendly friend, friend, see, friendly face, friend. There's already Emily. Emily, <laughs> friendly friend, friend. Looking at my lovely friend Michelle. I and feel we okay. we get to laugh on this podcast because, and I give us permission because it's so dark. And if you don't lighten it up, yeah, yeah. It's too dark. and you can't learn. And the whole point is to learn. The whole point. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you. You're Can welcome. we go insert that into all the other episodes? Let's put it in all the episodes. Put, okay, Krista says. So we're going to talk about. The 70s. Nice. My favorite generation. I would think I was, I mean, I wish I were an adult in the 70s. Not these adults, though, because it didn't turn out well for them. But it's a time when young girls were experiencing, like, new freedom. Mm -hmm. They had different freedoms, independence, music, nightclubs were all the rage. Um, And hitchhiking is a very normal way to get around at that time. It's a repeated theme in true crime (laughs) podcasts. (laughs) Like there should be a drinking game. Can we play? Anytime, <laughs> anytime you say hitchhike or red flag, you have to drink. Can we please go back to the 70s and tell all women, don't ever hitchhike? I mean, men too, but yeah. really. It, well, it was the co-ed killer. It was he who put this whole don't hitchhike. But then it was also the time of independence. So women were like, F you, I'm going to do what I want, but also, oh, shoot. Mm-hmm. So it's a, it's, it's a complicated thing, but it wasn't abnormal. So when you're thinking of these girls hitchhiking, think of it then. No, I, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Not from my 2022 lens. And and also the, and for the listeners, too, because it's easy to be like, oh, well, that won't happen to me because I don't hitchhike. But you would maybe have hitchhiked then, and it's a good to translate that to something we do now. Right. That could be putting us at risk. Internet dating. Oh, yes. Yeah. Bring a friend. Bring a friend. Bring a friend. Unless he's really cute. So Anne Arsenault is this really smart 17-year-old girl from Silver Spring, Maryland. She's warm. She's social. A creative girl. And um, she's on the drill team, which we used to have where we grew up, but it's no longer there. And it, she's on the drill team at John F. Kennedy High School. And she could see her like at the local fabric store making her uniforms. She's a, she's a good, typical girl teenager. And she was also a really good student. So she was set to graduate early. She loved studying history. She planned to go to college to do that. She loved the pioneer days, which I thought was really, (laughs) frontier days. Her mom described it. I thought it was really cute. And she was excited to graduate a year early though, because she wanted to go travel before college. She knew exactly what she was going to do. So I'm graduating early and I'm out of here. I'm taking off. So in February 1973, Anne and some friends from Silver Spring set off to the Florida Keys. How fun is that? Yeah. I mean, they're so That's excited. 17 year old. <laughs> I know. I mean, we kids were more independent than oh, we were more independent. The things that my parents let uh-huh. me let me do, go mm-hmm. to Europe, go backpacking around Europe. As a as a as young, a young 20 yeah. one year old, I think. Holy cow. I mean, the kids now don't even get driver's licenses because they don't want them. 
Right. It's changed. The pendulum has swung. Things are really different. So she's off. She's with friends. They're in Florida Keys. They're doing everything that teenagers do. They're at the beach. They're, you know, probably drinking beers at night. They're in the sun because it's also dead winter in Maryland. So Mm -hmm. they're they're like, sweet, Florida Keys. Can't go wrong there. So it's always sunny and warm, right? No excuses. So Anne and her friends spend... A, uh, like a month there and okay, a few weeks, not quite a month, but their next stop was going to be equally exciting. They were going to go straight from the Florida Keys to New Orleans for Mardi Gras. Oh my gosh. Right? I'm like, you go girl. Quite so, the trip. Quite the trip. And while she's in New Orleans, Anne calls her mom and she explained that instead of going back to Maryland, which was the original plan to just be gone like maybe two months, she's going back to Florida with... But this time to Gainesville and this time with new friends that she made in New Orleans. Okay. So now I'm starting to get worried. Well, only because it's a murder podcast, right. but maybe. <laughs> maybe Otherwise, I, we're happy for we're her like, and yay, her new fun friends. trip. Yeah. They travel like you travel. So in Gainesville, she meets 19 year old Janine Ligatino, and she's from Clintondale, New York, and grew up, which sounds like an idyllic life to me, on her parents' apple farm. Oh. How cute. And she's been spending her time between that farm and coming down to Florida. She's an artistic girl. She's known for these beautiful oil paintings of like the apple farm and the surrounding areas. I'm like, that's really sweet. She has four brothers, the only girl. Mm. And um, she loved to travel. So they become fast friends because not only do they both love to travel, they actually look a lot alike. They're both kind of shorter athletic builds, long brown hair, brown eyes, tan, like they're the 70s babes. So these two are like, they become yeah thick, thick as thieves. But obviously when you're traveling and you are 17 and 19, you're probably not flush with cash. So they start selling flowers on the side of the road. Okay, also doesn't feel super safe, but remember, we have it all the time here. Right. Yeah. No, that doesn't sound that bad. That sounds like, oh, that's pretty resourceful. Like you're going to somebody for Mother's Day. Ah, I need to bring a host gift. Right. Here we go. Here we go. I mean, they're always in the worst cellophane. Why can't they just do clear? (laughs) Right. So they're doing that, right? So they're they're making it work. They have some cash and it's, it's enough to sustain them. They're enjoying living in Florida. And Janine, she's in a bit of a pickle because she was supposed to graduate high school that year. But since she'd taken time off to travel, she's behind. But according to her father, it was like, he's like, she's a good girl. She's a beautiful, creative, wonderful girl who wanted something better than what she was experiencing at the time. So they supported that. Mm -hmm. And then in the first week of March, she calls her parents, or no, I'm sorry, she wrote a letter to her mother saying, I'm going to be home soon. She's going to come back. She's probably going to ostensibly finish high school. So soon after that, Anne, who's the original girl we talked about, the Mm -hmm. 17-year-old from Silver Spring, also called home um, and told her mom that she was considering staying in Florida to start her freshman year of college there. Mm. So one's going home to finish high school. The other one's going to stay. But in the meantime, they're having the best time of their lives. They're mm-hmm. just, you know, living the dream. And the during like their moment of careless, you know, lifestyle, they actually get boyfriends, which complicates things because it's harder to leave and easier to stay. So they're dating these two young men. One is named Buddy and the other one's named Como Joe. I'm like, that is awesome. Of course your name's Como Joe. <laughs> I love it. Yes. So on the night of March 10th, 1973, she's only been down there since February. They're just hanging out at a house, the four of them. So Anne, Janine, Buddy, and Como Joe are hanging out watching TV. And at around 10 o'clock, Anne and Janine decide to go to the store to get more cigarettes and beer. Again, another thing that we need to change our perspective on, because at the time... The drinking age was 18. Mm -hmm. So Janine's totally of age and Anne's almost of age. Right. And the smoking age was 16. Could have been 18 for Florida, but nationally it was 16. So they're not even doing anything illegal. Yeah. And by the way, who of us, I mean, I may have had a drink in high school. Maybe one. So they're like, okay, they start walking to town and it's Florida. So all of a sudden it's pouring rain out of nowhere. And that's when they accepted a ride from a man in a new blue Dodge Duster. Uh, oh. You don't even need to know what it is to know it's fabulous. Yeah. Oh, for sure. It's a Dodge, Dodge Duster. Duster. Yeah. I'm already getting How in that car. How could it not be fabulous? It's I a would Dodge get in Duster. Dodge Duster. Like, yeah. they're making this car. They're like, oh, it's smooth. Let's call it the Duster. <laughs> Who's not getting in that car? Uh, everybody's getting in the car. Everybody's hey, getting in the car. Look at this guy. Mm-hmm. Dodge well, Duster. I'm in. I think he probably knew that. 
there they go into the car into the car they go i wish they had not gone into the car right anybody who's victimized is a horrifying story but i can almost feel their energy see them right i totally you can imagine them on the side of the road i can picture the car pulling up and they're tan skin yeah and they're like Bubbly and giggly and having fun. And they have, we have each other. We're safe. Other. We're using the buddy system. They're not alone. And they're on the precipice of their new life chapters. The next day, their bodies are discovered oh, by God. a city worker who was paving the road nearby. Janine's body, Janine's the 19 year old, was found face down near the street where the, he was working. But Anne's body is found more than 150 yards away. She fought. Uh, so she probably watched her friend die. Yeah. And then she fought and she ran for her life only to fall down and die near a bush from internal bleeding. Oh, my God. Authorities have no idea who killed these young, beautiful girls or whether there's more victims out there. Because when a person's killed, you have the obvious need to find out who did this, bring them to justice. But you also, in law enforcement, have this fear of, uh-oh, is this someone who's going to do this again? Right. You know, and if it's someone who knew them ostensibly not but if it's it's not somebody they know they're out on the road their boyfriends are like they just they left yeah this doesn't seem like something planned it looks like a random killing so that that yeah that's when it's it stokes it it stokes the fear right i'm afraid to, i mean i i hate that i would hate to have that pressure to find a killer and knowing if i don't find him quickly enough he might do it again right but unfortunately it's nearly a decade until the identity oh, of the wow. murderer is revealed a decade a decade. So here's what happens. We're going to fast forward up to 1980, but there's a lot of stuff that happens in between. It's not linear because it's a decade and things yeah. happen that we know about and things happen we don't know about till right. later. On March 25th, 1980, a man picks up a woman named Donna Marie Hensley. She's a local sex worker and he takes her to a hotel. And where is this? Florida. Okay. So after services are rendered, this man starts acting really strangely and he goes on this tirade about how much he despises hookers. After he picks up and a sex worker. And has sex with her and pays her. Mm -hmm. And she, I'm like, know your audience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, right. What are you doing? Like, that's not... You want to pick her up again? And he's picked her up lots of times. Okay. This isn't her first time with him. Right. So now he's mad and, and she's like, um, okay. And she's like shimmying, tucking her money into her pocket, shimmying to the hotel door. Yeah. yeah. But he's like, uh-uh. Mm -mm. I'm not done with my thoughts. He's continuing on this very dark soliloquy about how much he hates hookers. And he's calling her a hooker. Uh -huh. I'm like, could you be a little less pejorative? Um, and then he demands his money back. He pulls out a knife. And demands his money back. There's important this detail. Is after he has picked her up on numerous occasions. Yeah, at least at least twice before. Okay. She knows who he is and she said she's been with him several times before. So she, and he's never done this before. Right. So she's like, oh, sure, here's your money. Not only does she give him back his money, she gives him an extra 30 bucks. Just throw that on top just of it. Whatever well, just you got Please do. leave. Just please. <laughs> Can you do, do, We're done here. And also weird, right? Yeah. So he attacks her anyway. She gives him money. He's attacking her. He's stabbing her with a knife, a bottle opener, a pair of scissors. I'm like, what Just is- anything he could get a hold of. But like, does he have a belt with all right. of this? He's like Inspector Gadget. But this is the weirdest part. You know what else he does? No. He pours muriatic acid on her. Oh. Evidently, that's like a really strong cleaning solvent that gets like Ouch. stains off of roads. I don't, did he have it all under, I don't know how, I can't figure like, out how this worked. And why he had all mm -hmm. these things with him. And that's my job to try to figure it out. And I'm like, okay, right. that was a really, that was a big departure from a normal, usually you stick to one weapon unless that weapon doesn't work and then you go to the other, right. but time is of the essence. Right. And I don't know why you have muriatic <laughs> acid in a hotel room that you rented with a sex worker. By the grace of God or whomever's in charge in this universe, Donna is still able to escape despite all those crazy oh ass injuries. Gosh, thank goodness. She runs to the hotel clerk. The hotel clerk calls her an ambulance. And then, of course, police show up, too. This guy's gone. He gets in his car, and he's like, I'm, I'm out of Dodge, naturally. But Donna is able to tell the police who the guy is. Right. She and other sex workers in the area had seen him many times. And she was even able to tell him where he worked. He made a fatal error here. Right. Which is good that he made it. And his name is Gerald Stano. Police arrest him. And when they ask about other murders, he starts talking. Oh. He doesn't really stop talking. 
they show him a picture of another girl named Mary Carol Marr, um, who was a 20-year-old who had been abducted and killed near Daytona Beach Boardwalk. And he admits he knew her and he refers to her in the past tense. Mm. So they're like, mm, that's how do you know she's you know, mm-hmm. dead? Well, you shouldn't know that. So eventually he starts admitting to all the murders. Oh. And what he describes as his reasons for doing it is nothing short of bizarre. So he was near her on the boardwalk. And you can tell this guy's, this isn't his first rodeo because listen how crafty he is. This, this is a killer who's honed skills and has become more brazen. And we see this in serial killing. I just said this in a different podcast. They do. They become emboldened by not getting caught. And they also need more of a thrill. So they up the ante. They become more brave. And he over, he's listening, he's eavesdropping, and he hears her say that she's supposed to call her mom when she's done, and her mom's going to come and get her and give her a ride home. So he finds a clever way to inject himself into the conversation, knowing already where home is and what's going on, and be like, oh, I'm heading this direction. And she's like, oh, that's where I live, whatever. And he offers her a ride. Oh, goodness. So she gets in the car with him, and then he says, she started bitching at me, and that annoyed me. So he stabs her in the leg so hard he breaks her femur. Oh, God. That's not his first stab wound. And this was a detail that nobody knew. It hadn't been released because, you know, the cops will hold on to some details. That if somebody confesses, they can, you know, see if they know. Right. Law enforcement knew they had their guy. So then he starts telling another story about a woman named Cheryl. Cheryl stormed out of a hotel after a fight with her boyfriend. She's wearing a bikini. And she starts hitchhiking home in a bikini. But we just off air talked about yeah college-age girls getting in fights like that. Right. And doing crazy things. And doing crazy things. Yeah. So even this is like, although we know as moms, we don't do this, but I'm not sure I wouldn't have at, oh, for sure, 19, 20 years old. Right. Well, Stano picks her up because she's hitchhiking and they get high in the car together. Not sure I would have done that. And then he asks her if she would like to have sex. And she, I think, gave him a very adamant held to the no. And so then he strangles and steps her. So that was, Yeah. He confesses all sorts of crimes. He says he killed 33 sex workers and hitchhikers, and all of them were somewhere between 13 years old and mid-30s. Oh, my God. This is a frustrating thing for me as I keep reading in these cases from the 70s and 80s. They say, oh, they kills women. He kills women. A 13-year-old is not a woman. A 13-year-old is so not a woman. Yeah. Uh, a 17-year-old is not even a woman, really. No. These are teenagers. No. So I, I just want to point that out because it makes me mad. Although I don't know if he was ever convicted or it was ever proven that he killed somebody that young, there were a lot of teenagers in the mix. So he killed all over Florida and would do it in so many different ways. How on earth does this go on for a decade without anyone catching him? Decades a long time. So when you're killing, serial killers can get away with it a little bit easier because they're killing either low-hanging fruit, people who are willing to get into your car, which a hitchhiker and a sex worker is willing to get into your car. And then- in this case of the sex workers, sometimes they're estranged from their families, right. so they don't get reported people missing. People don't know. So we see that people start often with sex workers, not because of, a, of some like disgust or rage against, and it might have been in his case, because it sounds like he had some negative things to say about sex workers, but we'll see that in serial killers who have no thoughts one way or another about sex workers. They're just trying to get the they're honing their craft. Yeah. And they're, it's, they're just getting the lowest hanging fruit, the, the quickest, cheapest high they can get. And it doesn't work. They have to mm-hmm. up the ante. But right. So he says that this is what he would do. When he'd pick up a woman, he'd ask for sex. If they politely declined, then he would be like, okay, and just drop it. But if they were rude, then he would kill them. Oh. And if they laughed at all, oh. he would kill them even more brutally. brutally. And he said, and I quote, I just can't stand a bitchy chick. Oh. I don't personally like bitchy chicks either, but I don't have any urge to stab Rarely them. Rarely have you stabbed people it's so and rare. tortured them. And my sister might say I did. I blackmailed her, but that was it. Oh. So not only did he break somebody's femur on occasion, but he broke somebody's breastbone. Oh my He'd gosh. mainly stab in the chest. By stabbing somebody. Think of the force. Yeah. So he's a strong guy too. Here's my personal favorite. Oh, no. If they didn't like his taste in music, particularly Donna Summer, oh, well. then he would kill them. My husband and I have different tastes in music, and rarely have I stabbed him over it. it I'm laughing because Sorry. Krista and her husband are the most 
even keeled, mild mannered, sweet oh, I, people I, on the planet. So even just go, like, go that far. But I mean, it's a weird choice because Donna Summer is like. She wouldn't be mad at her. She's fun. She's fun. She's okay if if you don't like her. You don't need to stab someone over this. But is, does she? Does that music like get him hyped up to do bad things, or maybe it gets him hyped up to calm himself down so he doesn't do bad things? Well, I had not thought of that, which is why you're here today because that ties into something I learned about his childhood, which is he was a horrible student, excelled at nothing except music. Except music. Gosh, you're good. Well, and music is such a you know, as we know, like that's one of the things you can use to calm yourself mm-hmm. down to get you, you know, when you're going out when you're 19 and 20 year olds in college and you're getting ready to go out, you have your playlist that you play. And now, you know, you was have... I supposed to stop doing that? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, no, because I still have. Okay, good, playlist. Good, good, good. Right. But, you know, it does. It can evoke so much emotion. And if that's the one thing mm. that he was really that he excelled at and enjoyed. Don't you take that away from Don't him. Don't you take that away. And it's probably the one thing he felt cool about because he was good at it. The yeah. only thing he was good at. Oh, yeah. you're so right. I had not put that together. Thank you. He tells law enforcement that before his 29th birthday, he had killed more than 41 people. Oh my gosh. But here's what's interesting. Even though sex is like the first request every time with them, it does not appear that any of his victims have been sexually assaulted. Oh. So he's killing just for the thrill of the kill. Yeah. He's not, we do get killers who kill for sex. it's almost like he's looking for an excuse, right? Right. There's a lot going on under this. So he's found guilty of only nine of the murders he confesses to, and he is sentenced to death for the murder of one particular girl who is 17-year-old Kathy Scharf. We'll revisit that later. And can I ask another question? No. What? what? (laughs) Of course. Uh, No one. Of course. Do we know why he ended up confessing? Do we think he was just bored and was like, all right, well, I've kind of done that? We we do find out a little bit about that, but that's interesting that you're already thinking that. Because I didn't think of that, and then until I read further into the case, I obviously did not work on this case. It's always different for me if I've worked on the case, because then I'm like, I know what's going on, but that's... You would have been pretty young to be working on this case. (laughs) I I, I think I was a gamete. So, yes, there is something weird about him canarying this, singing and telling everybody what's going on. Yeah. Actually, we're going to get into it right now. So he's given the death penalty for that last case, Kathy Scharf, and he's put to death on March 23rd, 1998. Okay. You have this appellate process that happens that delays execution. But what further delayed his execution is there was a man who was executed right before him and the electric chair misfired and it was a horrible, mm. torturous death. Mm. There were flames coming out of his head. Oh my God. It was bad. So they 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 stayed everybody's execution for a hot minute gotcha. to make sure that as they refer to him, old Sparky was working properly. So Stanos died a very scared man because he knows what's coming and he knows the inmate right before him died a horrendous death. Right. Stanos did not. He died quickly okay. in the electric chair. Why not just get busted for the one girl you attacked uh-huh. And why start admitting to... I mean, maybe they would have put the pieces together and he could see that coming. Maybe. But there's a ton of inconsistencies with some of the stories. There was a detective at the time named Paul Crow who was under investigation for having some bad processes. And there is an idea that he was feeding oh. Gerald Stano these some details. So they are like, is he a serial killer or a serial confessor? Ooh. But we know he killed some of these people. So... For the purposes of our podcast, it doesn't really matter, but it's a judicial nightmare. And here's why. Because he was executed based on the killing of Kathy Scharf. And that's the crime it looks like he didn't commit. That's a judicial problem. Right. It doesn't hurt us because we're talking about how not to raise a Gerald Stano. But also, if we haven't caught the killer. Oh, hadn't thought of that. Right? I mean, then that if he didn't indeed kill her, Someone does that did. mean that somebody could still... And you'll find this, like... People who want their cold cases solved will be like, aha, like throw them all. He, the guy was motivated. Right. And as humans, we want to make connections. Yes. yes. So you want to say, okay, was this one bad guy did these 40 bad things, not 20 bad guys doing two bad things. That's I mean, true. You know, We're self-soothing. Like, yeah. That's totally I mean, self-soothing. Like, okay, I figured it out. It's no longer scary. Yeah. Check the box. We're done. Okay. Whew. Yeah. Deep breath. Move on to the next thing. And now he's gone. Yeah. So yeah, there. This is so. When you listen to other podcasts about this, or TV shows, or read a book, you're they spend a lot of time talking about it because it it is it does point to some problems that we have in confessions. 
Right. And in prosecutions and in sentencing, Mm -hmm. you know, because he was put to death and he was a serial killer. But legally, had they overturned it based on the inconsistencies, he would have, they would have had to maybe even have an entire mistrial like and right. do it again that oh it has gosh. problems associated yeah. with it they don't take death penalty lightly as they shouldn't as one should not and you know we could have a podcast about all of the complications of that so who was this freak of nature right. who is gerald stano so he was actually born paul zeingart okay he was born september 12th 1951 in schenectady new york okay here's what's weird at 13 months old his mother gave him away he went to an orphanage and staff workers and, and particularly doctors said he was so neglected that oh. he was unadoptable. Oh my gosh. He was acting at like 13 months. 13 months. Eating, he was starved. So he was eating his own feces and acting in animalistic fashion. As one would. Right. Being neglected, horribly neglected for an entire year. Mm. See, I already have her almost in tears. I knew she'd be sensitive to this this one because it's gnarly. As as a, as parents, of course, child abuse is a thing. We all know child neglect's a thing, but um, it's really hard to imagine a baby being in that bad of shape to be just discarded. And also, how does that kid stay alive for thirteen months with that neglectful of a parent? Um, often they don't. So we'll talk about maternal early maternal rejection. That is our that is our oh. violence risk factor for today. Here we go. And it's a it's a death it's a risk factor for death for sure. Yeah. Even if you're being fed enough, mm-hmm. you a baby can die from not being held or attached to mm-hmm. somebody. Mm-hmm. So imagine what it can do for violence. Right. So we're going to talk about that. But first we're going to talk about at, after that first 13 months. A nurse felt horrible for him. Her name was Norma Stano and her husband, Eugene, and they adopted him and they renamed him Gerald. They loved him. Yeah. He had a great life, great upbringing, but he remained a mess. Yeah. He was wetting his bed all the time, which is up until he was too old to be doing that, which everyone always throws in there because it can be and, a predictor of future violence. too old? I think he was like 11. He was still wetting his bed. I, I, I don't, that doesn't bother that me, though. A, why is that a... There's a trifecta, hurting animals, yeah. wetting your bed, and starting fires. You've said that before, but, but the, what, what does bedwetting have to do with it? I'm unclear, and I probably should know. But I just wonder if it's not talked about. Like, is it also just that it happens to a lot of people, and we only talk about it with... Right. So, know. like, once you've dug into somebody's history, and this is yeah, what we do can, with murders. We dig back and try yeah, to find something. find all the things. Find all the right. things. Yeah. Maybe it's quite a frequent phenomenon, and it, we're making it look more so. Right. So, he would have these extreme tantrums, and he did so poorly in school. Like, I think the best grade he ever got was a D plus or a C minus. Mm. He did really poorly in school. He would steal from his classmates and his parents frequently. Mm. Sometimes... It was like to give to another student, but the the time he stole the most from his dad, he got caught, and he was using that money to pay other classmates to run behind him during track so he didn't look like such a loser. Oh. So, so sad. when we talk about his ego. Yeah. And and he he just he just was never okay. He no. was just never okay. So he did get arrested a couple times as a teenager, once for pulling the fire alarm at school, which I'm like, come on, that's fine. And then the other is throwing rocks over a bridge, which I've seen in several killers. Oh, I covered a school shooter and he did that exact same thing. And and it's not, it's a really easy way to cause a lot of damage and be almost uncatchable. Yeah. So I think it's a, it's a, it's an entryway into the thrill of a crime. Right. With low risk, unless you're dumb and you get caught, which seems to be him. So he does not graduate or get his GED until he's 21. And he went to computer school and he got a job at a local hospital working with computers. But then again, he goes back to his old habits. He starts stealing from coworkers and gets fired. So he has no game when it comes to girls, Mm -hmm. as we see later when he's killing everybody. But before he started killing everybody, he had no game. He had no experience, no luck. But around this time, he meets a woman and begins dating her. But here's the kicker. She's mentally disabled, mm. like big time. Not so he's taking advantage. Not of delayed. Her. Mm-hmm. Yes, he's taking advantage of somebody mm-hmm. with a disability, mm-hmm. and she gets pregnant. Mm-hmm. So her dad is naturally furious. He comes after him with a gun and demands that Stano get help this girl pay for the termination, make this right. 
Um, and so he does, and they, he never sees her again. So that's to give you an idea, like, that's the only date he could get. Interesting. And he had taken advantage of her, mm -hmm. I, I ostensibly. It, it, that's what right. it looks like to me. Right. So his parents send him to Florida to help with an ailing grandmother. And I think they were just kind of like, come on, like, failure to lunch. Let's go. Yeah. And in true fashion, he can't keep a job. He keeps stealing from coworkers. He just does what he does. This is really funny. He calls himself the Italian stallion. Mm. But he is arguably anything but that. He's average looking, but he didn't see that in himself. Mm -hmm. So he's got this, like these vast insecurities, but strange, unexplained self-confidence moments. Yeah. Um, he did finally get married at age of 25, but then he started abusing her right afterward physically. So they divorced and like shortly thereafter. Um, but didn't kill her. He didn't kill her. Probably because he knows he'd get caught, he for, get that caught one. for that one. He moves back with his parents because he can't hack it. Nothing about his upbringing screams a cause for becoming a serial killer except for this one very weird risk factor for violence, and that is early maternal rejection. Mm -hmm. Well, you'd think, though, that you once you know you're being rejected, it would impact you more, but it's not true. It impacts you most then. Well, because I got to believe that like your brain is developing. Exactly. So fast during that time that if those if it doesn't the connectors don't connect. <laughs> the connectors don't connect. No, you're absolutely right then about they, that. Then you know, can they ever are there certain things that you can only form during that first year of life? Are there certain parts of your brain that don't ever develop if they don't develop in infancy? With I in, don't know. Intense intervention they can, but nobody does that. And here's the thing, like we think of we think of something like a relationship with a parent as psychological. We think of that as, you know, oh, you feel, you perceive rejection. So, and, and that perceived rejection is has bad outcomes too. Not as bad as this. It is a biological phenomenon that we're looking at and it's yeah. brain development. So it, this is a re well-replicated risk factor for future violence overall. And we often see this in the history of psychopaths. We'll see that they've been given up at very er early age or not abused, but neglected or rejected or put into an institution. Mm -hmm. Nobody's putting them in an institution because they recognize they're a psychopath because they're seven months old. Right. So something happens in that early age. But you see this for all criminals. You can see that institutionalization at a young age is a good predictor of this phenomenon. So why does this matter? Children who are physically separated from their parents at this tender age, they exhibit emotional disturbances all along. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't go away. And this becomes very challenging for their caregivers. So then it begets abuse. It can beget future problems, but sometimes it doesn't. So when studies look at this, they're looking just at the maternal rejection. I should say maternal rejection coupled with birth complications, it's explosive, your risk factor of becoming a, a violent criminal. That's fascinating. So is it that the maternal rejection comes because of the birth complications? I mean, I was a I was a mom who had all the resources. I owned a home. Mm -hmm. I had a steady partner. I had my parents lived close by. And they're lovely. And having a having a baby was the hardest thing, the hardest thing I'd ever had. I I couldn't even imagine how hard it was. Like I had no idea. And yeah. I, and I was a teacher. I mean, I had every resource. You were waiting available, for that moment, right? And I wanted it. So I can only imagine the smallest thing goes wrong. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, and so like if you have a traumatic birth, I just think like of the people who have postpartum yeah. depression, mm -hmm. I think isn't like one of the main causes of postpartum depression is a traumatic birth. That's right. I didn't know that. Uh, so, well, I knew that those two things were related. I knew that traumatic birth can lead to postpartum, but I didn't think of postpartum leaving, leading to rejecting the infant. But Britt was just here and she said, well, wait a minute, those two things have to she, on her own, before I even mentioned that interaction, was talking about how it's traumatic for the mother, too. A birth complication, oh, yeah. obviously, is hardest on the kid, but because it's your brain, you know, but it's right. really traumatic on the mom. And then what, and she was saying that she believes that postpartum depression is like bedwetting, so much more common, and we right. don't talk about it. One of the things that I that I don't think, and I'm not going to get political here, but mm -hmm. we really don't support moms. That ain't political. I mean, That's parents fact. And parents in general, but really we don't support moms 
very well in this in this country mm-hmm. and um, in lots of places in the world. But it is so lonely. It's I mean, so isolating. It's so isolating. I remember like the UPS guy would pull up to the, and I'd be like, oh my God, it's UPS guy, my friend. He's like, there's, he's like, there's oh, this, there she, is. there she is coming, running out. Yes. Yeah, so excited to see me. But and it was normalizing, just, you know, when you're at home and if you have a partner, your partner's at work. If you don't have a partner, I mean, there you are mm-hmm. all day long with somebody who just screams at you all mm-hmm. day long. And it, it they're tyrannical. Mm-hmm. It's like being in an abusive relationship. And they're the most wonderful babies of the most newborns. I, I love a newborn, but it's a very physically trying. I can't believe yeah. we do it. And I can't yeah. believe we do it more than once. I know. And then you're recovering. And then you you feel terrible. Mm-hmm. You're recovering. Your body is so weird. And you don't, you, you know, Milk nothing comes out of you. Yes. And nothing looks and feels the way mm-hmm. it used to. And you have a different relationship with your partner. And and then there's this whole other human that didn't live here yesterday. It's an interloper. Yeah. Here Where it is. You come from? And we, all you're doing is yelling at us. Right. And I should say, if you aren't producing milk, then you feel horrible that you're not producing Exactly. Milk. There's just so many layers. And so many things that can go wrong. Oh, and, and the hind milk and foremilk problem. You had it oh and I had. Oh, my gosh. We yeah. make too much. She makes all the milk, but yes. it's all foremilk, so there's yes. no fat in it. Yes. I had non-fat milk. You would freeze it, and it would turn blue in the freezer because mm. it was like water. Um. Yeah. So... My kids. Okay, so now we know that this is how children get rejected because sometimes they don't even have all these resources. Exactly. I had all the resources and it was so hard for me. Yeah. So, what does somebody with who's missing just one piece of that? How do we expect them to raise good humans Mm -hmm. in isolation? It really is kind of amazing that so many people do. You and really we don't have, have the community it. that we used like other no. countries. So I lived in France, and it was a it was a group effort. Like a mom was good enough. Like mm-hmm. a mom would handle the little ones. Uh, you could lean on each other, and I always felt I never wanted to lean on them because I'm very American in my thinking. Like no, uh, we're we're individualists. We take care of our we sweep, sweep our side of the street. It's a we have an American thing going on there. Yeah. And yeah, it's hard. It it is. It's really hard. I I just recently started volunteering at a, a shelter um, for families, and so I'm working a couple hours a week with a family who has recently been housed, and she has a partner wow. and and two little kids. And I was talking yesterday. We had her graduation okay. from moving out of the shelter. Her kids are are really little. It's really hard to go from living in a group setting. Where maybe these people aren't your aren't the people you would choose to be living with, but now all of a sudden you're in an apartment by yourself, mm. and it's a nice apartment, and you're happy to be housed, and you're making things work for yourself and for your family. But it's so isolating. She has to walk forty five minutes to get to a park, and a and a library, and and these things are are difficult. And she doesn't know she doesn't know anybody. And then there she is with these two brand new little people all day long by herself. And that's the definition nobody, of an insane asylum. I mean, it's crazy, right? I mean, there's nobody to hold that baby just so you can pee. I would or never have thought about that. Have 10 minutes to eat to eat a meal. And I, I think as, um, as a stay-at-home mom, which I have kind of sort of been mostly, I mean, I've worked part-time for most of most of my kids' lives, but you have guilt about not working and not providing income. But if you think about it, the working parent, they can they get to go to a place where they see other people, they can have a conversation, they can eat their lunch without anyone, I don't know, stealing their food, throwing, you know, like kicking the plate off of it, you know. They can go like, to the bathroom. They can go to the bathroom in peace. They can have five minutes of just you know, time to meditate or deep breathe or whatever it is. Pardon. I'm stunned right now because I always thought of, gosh, how hard it would be to be a mom in a shelter situation. And we have, you know, being unhoused is not that uncommon for young moms, guys. No. Like, it's a, they're no. not the ones you see on the side of the street necessarily. No, but but it, I think it's the biggest percentage. Wow. But I would think that once you get an apartment, life gets easier. But what you're describing sounds really depressing. It's very isolating. Yeah. yeah. Right. And so that's what I was talking to the women at the shelter about was, especially for someone with young kids. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, if your kids are school age, you've got a little more resources. But right now, she and her partner are sharing a car. He's taking the car to go to work. So they're, you know, so what are the resources that we can put in place for her to make sure that she 
has a good mental space so that she can be a good parent. And she's doing an amazing job. No one knows about this, but there is a t- ton of programs. There are a ton of programs. It started in the 70s with this nurse program. And I talk about it a lot. Yeah, you've talked about that. I've talked about it. They come in and they take you while you're pregnant and they train you so that you don't reject your baby because people know that, right, it's, there's risk. They're not well-funded, but you can, and we'll put this website in the show notes. There are like, you need formula, you need this, you need psychological support, you need information. Um, there actually are programs that will provide it. But the problem is you have to look it up yourself or right. someone has to do that for yeah. you. Yeah, They're not, we all don't know about them. No. And you don't know what your situation is going and to be. It should be automatic. Mm-hmm. Because I, I, you know, I have friends who have, like me, have all the resources who had postpartum depression mm-hmm. who really struggled to bond with that with that infant. Another thing that really helped me out, and I don't know how prevalent this is, but I went to a parent education program through our local community college Mm -hmm. that was free. And it was three hours a week. And it was, um, you know, the babies would play and it it went from, you know, you would sign up for your age group, but that was another lifesaver for me. And that's something that is accessible to everybody. So long as you can get there, get there. Yeah. And, um, and, you can have a three-hour chunk of time. And you don't have other kids everybody. that you have to drag to it. Well, unless you can go to the multi-age class okay, or whatever, then. you know. And and I don't know if other community colleges have this. I know that our two local ones do, local ones but do. I don't know. And the beauty is they always have a bus stop at a college. Colleges always have a bus stop. Right. So you can always... But you have a bus stop at your apartment. You don't. You know? Not like if you're walking 45 minutes. Right. I mean, that's the thing. Well, and just getting two babies onto a bus. <laughs> to go to a class for an hour. Trivial. It's but not these trivial. were three hours. And so you really got... Oh, okay. You really got... It was very fulfilling, right? You got time with other adults. You got downtime. You felt like you were doing something healthy, healthy for your baby, but it was really for you as for a mom. You. So in these studies, they learned that, of course, the babies who, in this particular study, I've talked about a thousand times, you, they came in, they visited every single month, and then every month until the kid was two, the moms got better. Right. And that was an unintentional um, result. And it it really informed why all these programs exist. There are different programs in different states. So we'll put this website up, but there are programs... If you are an exhausted, resource-deprived, scared mom of multiple kids, possibly, I don't know that you're like, okay, I'm going to look this up and get there and yeah. fill out the applications. But it, so they exist, but the accessibility is an additional problem. So again, this needs to be something that you've talked about before, that pediatricians need to say, you know, and it needs to be a part of the process, mm-hmm. right? Like you sign up for your Lamas classes or whatever your your birthing classes are, and you're also going to sign up for this program mm-hmm. that is, you know, supporting you for the first, even if it's those first three months mm-hmm. before that baby smiles and laughs at you. Well, and here's the thing. People don't recognize that it's a biological importance. We know from, and I'll talk about a little bit about what exactly is going on in the brain, but there are, we all heard about those Eastern European um, Cold War orphanages, orphanages, right? Where they were just so overrun with children that they literally didn't have enough people to pick them up. Yeah, not because they wanted to mistreat newborns, but there was physically not enough people in minutes in the day. And the mental disabilities—they, if you are not touched yeah. in this first year, and even rhesus monkeys. Remember, they did the monkey experiment. Right. They give the the metal monk mom fake mom. They make a mom out of metal that gives milk. And then they did the one where they just added some fake fur. fur. Those guys were okay because they felt like they had. So it's neuronal connections. It's brain development. And the maternal care plays a very significant role in neurocircuit development. And I want to say it right. It is actually neurodevelopment disorder. It is not warm and fuzzy. It's not, oh, this is soft psychology and I needed to feel accepted. This is your brain developing. We're kind of born as fetuses still. You're mm-hmm. in the fourth trimester, which makes right. no sense because tri means three. But, and the reason we do that is we have to have small babies because we are bipedal, so our hips aren't big enough to deliver something like a horse that can get up and walk around right. within four seconds. We Our babies are incredibly needy and they need so much of us. So their brains aren't fully developed and it's this experience of touching, of connecting to your parent, touching, 
feeling them that is your brain development. So maternal deprivation has cognitive, behavioral, and um, psychological effects, as we know, but it's it's literally the prefrontal cortex connecting to the amygdala. So according to this author, Wyden, this connection c- continues to grow through adolescence. However, if, if it's stopped during that first year, that's where you get the problems. Oh. It's So children withdrawn from maternal care had these negative coupling between these two very important brain structures. So that's actually what's happening. It's a it's not a oh you should touch your baby because it's good and you know talk yeah why is it that I'm always hear about hearing about talk to your baby for because it helps their reading development. How about pick up your baby pick so their your brain baby. grows. Hold their baby. Hold, hold your, baby. your baby. Hold your baby. Hold your baby. Hold your baby. You hold and even it, it's so Smell fascinating to the me. The top of their head. They um they recognize their parents voices. So, their smells at the top of their head is so good. I remember you let me smell your babies. Um, That to me is like, when I talk about risk factors, I find myself frustrated, especially with social psychologists or talking about, well, you look back into somebody's past and you can find divorce. You can find, well, he didn't have very many friends. Oh, he was bullied. All of those can be risk factors, but we have biological preventable risk factors with even stronger correlations to future violence. Why aren't we hearing about that from our OBGYN and our pediatrician? Like you have to be holding, there was this whole idea of you put your baby down because you don't want to spoil it. You get the tummy time Mm -hmm. and then, you know, there's all about how they sleep and what they're eating and are you getting your shots and all of that. Are you holding your baby for X amount of hours a day? You have to hold them a lot. And and it's, um, again, putting more pressure on the moms. And I don't mean to do that, but these kids, you, you, you can measure it right away. <laughs> these kids, especially if they were given away, institutionalized. Like if you took care of your baby for as long as you could and then gave it up for adoption, that baby's going to be fine. It had a connected connection to somebody. Right. But if the baby's rejected, and by that means it's it might be given its basic needs, food and water, but it's not picked up. And we keep saying maternal. Well, the studies are all on the that. The studies are all on that. But, but it's I just would one imagine, parent. It's just a human, it's right? A, and it's it doesn't have to be a human. parent. It doesn't have to be a parent. It can be a grandparent. It can be a... A father, a mother. It can be a babysitter. It can be a babysitter. It, it's supposed to be a constant. So it's be some, right. somebody that okay. you're attached to somebody. Yeah. You're attached to a person. You don't even have to like the baby. You just got to pick it up. So it's better if you like it because they do know. But it's it's um, it's um a huge predictor of problems. And you'll see it with these kids. So you take somebody like Gerald Stano and you put him with a loving, wonderful couple and they can't make up for yeah. it. Yeah, You're going to see things like... um emotional stress, excessive crying, aggressiveness, negativism, shyness, sensation and attention-seeking behavior, selfishness, stubbornness. These are all things that were statistically significant in this population. And we find there's all sorts of killers. Off the top of my head, Ted Kaczynski institutionalized. Mary Toppin, the Jolly Jane killer, institutionalized for that year. You'd be better off being institutionalized in sixth grade. Yeah. It's it there's something about this very early rejection mm-hmm. that's really it's really pertinent. So you mentioned earlier that there are interventions mm-hmm. that you can do to possibly repair that brain damage. What does that look like? Well, so first of all, you have to have somebody recognizing that this is even a thing. So he- even though this mom was a nurse and had more resource more resources probably. She didn't know. Then yeah. Why why would you know? Why wouldn't you think, well, I'm just giving this baby mm-hmm. a loving home? Well, baby, and I think it would be would think that it's not too late. Well, and we always feel like that, right? You feel I think of like a foster child, I feel like of an abused child, like I'm gonna love this out of him or her. Yeah. I'm going to show this child, but you can't undo brain damage with that. Or it's not brain damage. You can't undo this brain structure. Yeah. This stunted development. There are ways to increase your brain structure and function, which we never thought before. And it's it's the same stuff I always say. There are now professionals who can scan your child. It used to be a definitive prognosis. Your brain s- stays the way it is. That's We know that's not true anymore. So you get them into these behavioral programs. You get them into these cognitive behavioral programs. You get specialists, therapists to intervene. That's going to look like behavioral therapy, um, occupational therapy, psychological 
therapy. Mm -hmm. It's also going to look like a lot of the omegas. We always talk every single one. But in case you're the one person who listens to one podcast of this whole series, (laughs) what's our theme around here? Omega-3s. That seems to fix everything. You are not going to completely eradicate this stunted neurodevelopment, but you can improve it. So if I'm a heaven on earth saint of a person. Which you are. Who adopt, no, no. Are these resources all available to these yeah. incredible humans who, who do this? Especially if you're fostering or adopting, they're okay. all available. They, there's, a, there's a ton of, again, you have to be willing to sit, in, willing to sit with paperwork. Yeah. You have to be willing to work with the social worker. You have to be willing to find out information about what it means to go to adopt a baby or foster a baby who's gone through complete maternal rejection or paternal rejection. Yeah. What it means to have a baby who's been institutionalized. It looks different. It looks like this. And we know they are at risk for becoming a murderer, not just for crying and having temper tantrums. They're at risk for killing. Right. So why this has not been talked about, this? these studies are 20 years old, but no one says it. I feel like I'm kind of a jerk because I'm just making parents afraid, but I feel like you don't have to listen if you don't want to know, but I always wanted to know this stuff. Of course. Yeah. You want to know. I want to know. You want to know so that you can do something. You can, And there are things to do. It's the whole point of your podcast. It's the whole point of the podcast. You can do something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I call it feeding veggies with the murder porn because (laughs) everyone seems to be interested in true crime stories. Obviously, I'm interested in true crime, but we can't know that there's stuff we can do to reduce it without trying to talk about it and get it out there. Yeah. And it's just not out there. Okay. So I have another question. Uh Oh, I hope I have the answer. Do we know anything about his mom other than the fact that she rejected him. We don't know for sure. He thought she was a sex worker. So that's why he punished sex workers. Oh, okay. But then I think that was, information was corrected. We know that she wasn't, this wasn't like a teen mom or a young mom who was on the fence and realized I can't provide what the child, what this child needs. This was somebody who had this baby and like that was the end of their job is just to deliver it and maybe feed it sometimes. Mm-hmm. And that was the end of their, you know. Went about living their life and just every now and then. He he would have probably been okay had she given him away right away. Right. He probably, right. This all would not have happened, most likely. Right. Again, I'm simplifying crime. I don't want to do that. It's layered. These are things that we know can lead on their own, and even more so coupled with birth complications, can lead to increased chances for criminal behavior and recidivism and worse type of violence. Like, It's got bad outcomes. Does that mean every kid who's rejected is going to become criminal? No. Absolutely not. Probably most of them won't. Right, right. But it's a risk. And also, they have all these other risk factors. Right. You know, just not being able to keep up in school, and which is another risk factor for all sorts of bad things. All sorts. So we don't know much about her. Uh, She should have given up this baby right away. We don't know if that's exactly what made this killer a killer, but we know it can. I want everyone to undo that notion that zero after zero to five, your brain's not plastic anymore. It's not true. Yeah. We can increase. I mean, there's neural growth, there's alternative neural neural pathways that happen that we didn't know about before. Right. I, we grew up, I grew up in a house where the motto of our house was basically to be a lifelong learner. So my parent, my mom still takes French classes. My dad started playing the bass guitar when he was in his sixties. And I mean, they're just constantly learning. And so that's, their brains are still growing, even though they're in their late 70s. Absolutely. They're staving so, off dementia and Alzheimer's too, P.S. I hope and so. Depression. It's in, it's in their family, both of their families. So yeah, let's let's do what we can to continue to to learn and change our brain and structure. And change your brains. And that's, yeah. that's the Never thing. It's never too late to change it's your brain. It's not too late. And even in older children, even in adults, you can do these things. You can... Um, so I was talking about the therapies you would take if you were to have a baby who was rejected. All the you bring in all the therapists. Yeah. You look it up. You get a specialist. You get somebody who knows what they're doing to help you, and you call on these resources that are out there. But you're gonna. What the point of this podcast is? You got to know that this is a very odd risk factor. Yeah. Nobody knows about it. And maternal rejection, like who even? I mean, but it makes so much sense. It makes sense. Because and we of, we do all know about well not all but about the studies about the the orphanages and what we heard Europe. is that they um, what we heard is that they were mentally disabled what we didn't hear that those who weren't that like if you're severely mentally disabled you're not killing people 
what we didn't hear is that the ones who weren't that bad could go on to become killers. Like Mm -hmm. they could go on to become criminal. This kind of maternal rejection coupled with birth complications, it's replicated in multiple countries around the world. And and we don't know if he had birth We don't know if he had birth complications. Yeah, we just know that he was rejected. We don't know that he did. We do know that he was rejected and, and very dramatically rejected. And yeah. that you're going to see a bad outcome and it looks like this was his bad outcome. Was he going to become a killer anyway? I cannot say yeah, for sure he right. wasn't. You don't know. I don't know what his genes are. I don't know. Maybe his mother's a murderer, his bio mom. I don't know. And we all know that that's the biggest predictor of you becoming a criminal is if you share genes with a first order relative who's a criminal. Mm. Yeah, um, that's bad news bears. But if this is one of the risk factors and it's not insignificant and you don't know the baby you're getting, whether or not he or she has both risk factors. You might have a log of how, how they were born, but you don't know for sure. Um, it, it's just, you're going to have to be active. You're going to have to find out all the things. You're going to have to be doing the oils. You're going to have to doing the biofeedback. You're going to have to have them in all of these therapies. And you're going to have to watch them mm-hmm. really, really closely. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, if you see that there's a lack of Whatever it is, um, there are programs, and we've talked about those before too, that if a child is on this trajectory, the interventions aren't working, there are places that will step in and help, like Mendota. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I think in Mendota, you get assigned to it. I don't know if you can choose, but there are, there are ones. But again, it comes down to resources. Right. You know. But wouldn't it be better to, not to reject focus your baby? resources on new parents Oh then God. on prisons, like, wouldn't it be awesome yeah. if we could spend, I mean, even a little chunk of the money that we spend on prisons and take that and put that on those first five years. Mm-hmm. So we, there, you know, we see ads on television. Okay. You're spending money on ads on television. Let's put our money where our mouth is and really support parents. And where the research is, like the research shows, I, I talked about Levi King when he talked about how his mom I mean, every one of those kids was at a huge risk. They had no money. They had no electricity. They had no They had no idea how to take care of a baby. They didn't know to stop drinking and smoking. There are programs that teach us that the outcomes for the kids in these programs and the moms and the subsequent kids, because the moms got better, reduces criminal populations. Like, it just mm-hmm. makes sense. Why don't we want to do that? It's not theoretical. It's, no. It's not theoretical. You know, it's like I always hear people talk about like gun debates and mental health and school shootings. Like, well, it won't help because look at Chicago. Okay, you're taking, that's theoretical. Like we're talking about what theoretically might help that situation. This has been studied since the 70s. The programs have been in place since the 70s and the outcomes are the same. The the families, the children at risk and the moms, the families at risk, when they get the support from programs like the nurse study program, they do better. They do better and they don't go to jail. As often. I mean, some of them still go a little bit of jail. But because they have, you know, multiple risk factors. But we know, we know about nutrition. We know about prenatal care. We know all of that. And we're not supporting anybody. Mm-mm. And it's not too late. It can't be like, oh, I'm an at risk pregnant mom. It has to be like, I have a two and a four year old and yeah. I need help. Yeah. Because if you're in, in a lower SES and even if you're not, yeah. I mean, anyone, you go into the doctor's office. I mean, what are your touch points? Yeah. It's just your pediatrician. Gosh, and do they even have pediatricians, some of these women? Yeah, who knows? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, it's it, it's a frustrating phenomenon. It's so easy to have a baby. It's so easy it's to make a baby. It's so hard to raise a baby. Yeah, it's really hard. It's really hard to raise a baby. And I feel like um, the pediatricians in particular, it, it's just this break of like, okay, you go from your OBGYN to your pediatrician. I feel like there should be some continuity. Yeah. Like someone who kind of cares for you and tells you what yeah. to do all. <laughs> and there are probably countries that do that, right? Mm-hmm. And that does seem like the, like 200 years ago, that was the standard of care, right? Like probably your midwife mm-hmm. delivered your baby and then took care of you for. Mm-hmm. I mean, we were just talking about, can you imagine being up for two days First of all, you don't sleep that last month. I can't. No, no one wants to hear this again because I literally just said it. But you don't sleep the last month. Then you have the baby. You're going through war, and then you're up every hour. Like you, you're not capable. No, your brain is not functioning yeah. at, a, at a normal. And so, if you're thinking level. about where my next meal is coming, how am I going to pay rent? Um, who's going to watch the kids? How am I going to work? And, and and how and keep another human alive? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's no joke. 
It's no joke. So that, I guess, is the takeaway from this is not to freak you out, but just <laughs> to to know that there are, you know, there are things that aren't as obvious that can lead to criminal behavior. They're preventable. That's preventable. Rejecting child rejection or yeah. is, is preventable. Don't do it. But if you did it and somebody's adopted that child or fostering that child, or even if that child's in an institution, right. this stuff has to be applied. You have to, you know, there right. are things to do. And the earlier, the better. Yeah. It's one of those things that you don't want to stigmatize somebody who's already had a rough, shaken life. But again, the goal is to kind of destigmatize the, the brain is an organ. Mm -hmm. And if you're just helping it like you would give insulin for diabetes and kidney problems and liver problems or pancreas in that case, we need to look at the brain as that. It's not a it's not a personality disorder. This is a neurodivergence. Right. Okay. Do you have anything else you want to add or questions or I don't think so. No, we get it. We did it. You're pretty amazing. I'm not amazing. This you is... pretty are. You really are. No. Thank you so much, Krista. Thank you for coming here. And thank you for listening. You're so welcome. How Not to Raise a Serial Killer is a Cloud 10 Media production. Executive produced by me, Dr. Michelle Ward, and Sim Sarna. Our editor is Emily Crane. Our music was created by Josh Cook with artwork provided by Brian Stefanik. Follow us on Instagram at How Not to Raise a Serial Killer and on TikTok and Twitter at Hentrask. That's at H-N-T-R-A-S-K. And if you'd like to share a story or ask a question, you can email us at hownottoraiseaserialkiller at gmail.com or call and leave a voicemail at 818-392-4403. If you like our show, do me a favor and rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. After all, if more people know about the show, maybe fewer kids will turn into serial killers. Who knows? Thanks so much for listening. See you next week. Mm -hmm.